Marquez from Fox 13, and then we will jump in some panel discussion and some conversation with y'all from there. Thank the Great Salt Lake is on the brink of collapse. It's the story of many terminal lakes around the world, desiccated from a warming climate and water consumption that's out of balance. But Utahns don't need to look far to see why the Great Salt Lake is worth fighting for and what they stand to lose if it turns to dust. Owens Lake. 250 miles north of Los Angeles, has already been through what the Great Salt Lake is now facing. Our multimedia reporting showed the worst case scenario of a dried up valley, loss of bird habitat and food, and nearby communities choking on dust. We also showed the work being done to mitigate dust plumes at a cost of two and a half million dollars to the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Bill Kidu has spent 17 years watching Owens Lake transform from an environmental disaster to a place where the birds have returned and the air is finally clear. You know, the success of the project is, it actually truly is incredible. You know, to take the largest source in the entire nation, control it, you know, through mechanisms that were developed and studied here at Owens Lake. And then, you know, the cost, which, you know, you put the total price tag at, say, 2.5 billion, which sounds atrocious and absurd, um, pound for pound of emission reductions, it's the cheapest dust control project for fugitive emissions in the entire country. 13 miles east of Yosemite National Park, near Lee Vining, California, lies Mono Lake, a virtual twin to the Great Salt Lake. Both have trillions of brine shrimp, Islands for migrating birds, and both are tourist attractions. The public saw where Mono Lake was headed, and a grassroots committee saved it under the public trust doctrine, arguing the state had the duty to protect it. In 1983, the California Supreme Court ruled in Mono Lake's favor. It's a case legal scholars lauded, with some proclaiming it revolutionized Western water law. Despite the California State Water Resources Control Board mandating lake rise in the mid-1990s, Mono has yet to hit its ideal level. What does that bode for Great Salt Lake? There's a legacy of those excessive diversions that even though it's not happening today, it wasn't happening yesterday, carries on. Great Salt Lake, back at home, it is becoming clear that we can't mitigate what we can't measure. If the Great Salt Lake turns to dust, the pollution can be controlled, but it's going to be exorbitantly expensive. Owens Lake is a fraction of the Great Salt Lake size. The Great Salt Lake Collaborative also needs to move into the community with events and other awareness-raising endeavors. So please consider supporting the Collaborative with a contribution today at greatsaltlakenews.org. I'll use it for the recording. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marcy Young Cancio. I'm a professor of journalism and digital media at Salt Lake Community College and also the director of Amplify Utah, which is dedicated to increasing representative storytelling in local media through student journalists. And we are one of the partners in the Great Salt Lake Collaborative, which brings together 23 different organizations from across the state to try to find solutions through reporting out of Great Salt Lake. 13 of our partners are news organizations who are working together in partnership for the first time in the history of news in the state of Utah. It is really pretty impressive to see people who are typically competing with each other coming together to do reporting on solutions around one of the biggest environmental crises facing the greater Salt Lake area. Um, part of the group includes Heather May, who is the project director for the Great Salt Lake Collaborative, which is a solutions journalism project, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, Manuel Rodriguez, who's a photographer at Fox 13. Leah Larson, who is the land and water use beat reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune. 
Uh, and then we also had reporters from the Deseret News and KSL who joined on this trip to California to do some reporting on Owens Lake and Lake Mono. Um, just a little primer on solutions journalism. Uh, well, first the collaborative. The collaborative came together to look for solutions um, to this crisis facing the Great Salt Lake. And solutions journalism is really meant, it's not advocacy journalism. We're not out here pushing an agenda or advocacy at all. But solutions journalism is, I have a great quote here, has been described as hope with teeth. But really what that means is that it's, covering what works without the fluff. It is rigorous and compelling reporting about responses to social problems. So rather than, oh my god, everything's going to heck and we're all going to die, it's, oh my gosh, everything's going to heck and we might die, but maybe we won't if we do this. And it's doing the reporting to find some of those solutions. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, you can learn way, a lot more on the collaborative by going to greatsaltlakenews.org and on solutions journalism generally by Googling Solutions Journalism Network, because I don't know their URL off the top of my head. Okay, so let's start with the why and the how of this collaborative specifically, which is a two-year collaborative funded by the Solutions Journalism Network in part to do this sort of reporting. Um, so Leah and Manuel and Heather, how did this I'll let whoever wants to jump, maybe Heather take this one. How did this collaborative come together? And then we'll turn to Manuel and Leah about why the Great Salt Lake is the focus. Does this work? No. Is that working? That work? Yeah. There we go. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm Heather May, the project manager of the Great Salt Lake Collaborative, and this came about because we, the group of organizations that are part of this collaborative, received a grant from Solutions Journalism Network last year to create us. We're funded for two years, and um, the group decided what topic to focus on and um, rightly chose the existential crisis uh, facing us via the Great Salt Lake. and. Um, the news partners came together. The goal is the journalism, rigorous journalism on solutions, but we also have community partners, um, including libraries, which is why we're here tonight. Um, we also do other events, such as tours of Saltaire and uh, community anthology in order to raise awareness about what's going on with the lake in a variety of ways, because we can't just rely on people to read the journalism. We want to take the journalism to the public. You want, you want us to talk about why the Great Salt Lake matters and why that's the focus? Yeah, my question here is uh, why the Great Salt Lake is a focus and why does... Why the Great Salt Lake is the focus of this collaborative and why the future of the lake matters so much in this valley and across the state. Um, well, I'm sure the people who came tonight already know why the Great Salt Lake matters or you probably wouldn't be here, but um, it supports about 12 million migrating birds each year. Um, which is a lot. Uh, it supports a billion, 1.5 to 2 billion dollar industries, um, economic benefit to uh, Utah. And I think why a lot of people right now are paying attention to the lake and realize it matters is that uh, is when it has water in it, it's protecting us from some bad uh, toxic dust pollution. So that's probably an oversimplification. It's also a beautiful natural wonder that just, you know, has its own intrinsic value. But. Um, uh, mine is a more simple answer. Um, why I think it matters is because of the fact that um, growing up, uh, just being um, familiar with the Salt Lake and having people come and visit, and the first thing they ask about is, wanting to see the Great Salt Lake. And to me, um, there's obviously a big importance on, on what the lake means to the state. And so um, really, I think it's just important because um, if we don't have it, then I mean, it's gonna be kind of weird to uh, live in Salt Lake and not have actually have one. Um, I think that's like the weirdest reality that we could be facing. Um, and people are really gonna miss it, I think. And even from me coming from Southern Utah, um, I mean, the Great Salt Lake means a big deal to me, um, just because even when the first time I saw it, it took me a few years to actually go to it. 
it was absolutely stunning and beautiful and everything about it is, is absolutely amazing. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's important, but I think for me, it's just like a, more of a personal thing, but you know, yeah. And today we're going to be focusing specifically on what was learned from this reporting trip to California. But if you are interested in checking out the wide range of reporting and work that's been done, there's dozens and dozens of stories that have been published over this first year of the collaborative, touching on just about every issue affecting the lake. Some of the stories are kind of primers and educational, some go deep into the solutions. They're print-based online in the newspapers. They're broadcast pieces on radio and on television, their digital media pieces, um, their interactive uh, digital pieces as well. So there's a wide variety of reporting, but today we are going to focus on this reporting trip to California. Um, so we had this team from KSL, Fox 13, Desert News, and the Salt Lake Tribune who went to California to look at a couple of much smaller Salt Lake lakes compared to saline lakes comparatively to Great Salt Lake. Um, and so, Leah, let's start with you. Why Lake Owens and Lake Mono specifically? And what are the differences between those two lakes? Yeah, so I did get some questions from readers about why did you go to these lakes that are a lot smaller than the Great Salt Lake? Why not go to a lake of comparable size? But the reason I wanted to go to these two specifically is because we share a geography in the Great Basin. Um, and you know, we could go to the Aral Sea in Central Asia, but they have a totally different political system, totally different kind of budget, and all those kinds of nuances. So anything that they're doing there, proposing there, maybe wouldn't necessarily translate here. Um, and then also we are, are connected to these lakes by these migrating birds. They support similar species. Um, and then I think they all, both, kind of point to two directions we could go to the Great Salt Lake. We could go the direction of Owens Lake, which is pretty much dry, dried completely into this dust salt pan, or we could go the direction of Ono Lake, where some environmental groups fought back and secure the lake's right to exist. Um, it's still having problems, of course, but uh, you know, just two potential paths for the Great Salt Lake that, that seem reasonable for us, I guess. And so as you headed to these lakes, I mean, you're a given, you're where the land and water use beat reporter, it seems like that makes sense. Um, Manuel, why did you raise your hand for this particular project, and how did this team come together? Um, um, maybe without some of that expertise that Leah has. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for real, Leah really is the expert on this, and I'm kind of just there existing um, in her world. But really, it's just, I, I decided to be a part of this because I, I've covered a lot of uh, new stories in my lifetime. I've been doing this for about 12 years now, and um, this one felt really big to me, and it felt like it's something that has huge implications and huge impact, not only on me, but people that I you know, live around. So that's kind of the big reason why I wanted to take part in all of this, and it just felt like probably the one of the best opportunities I could have had to educate uh, my friends and family and hopefully other people will just be able to see and get more knowledge about what's what's going on at these other lakes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more. Is that echo bothering folks? Is that okay? All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Lake Owens, or Owens Lake, that you described as a dust and salt pan. What are some of the engineering solutions that Los Angeles has come up with to mitigate this dust, and would any of these solutions work for Great Salt Lake? Why or why not? Um, yeah, so they've been experimenting at this lake for about 20 years, just trying everything under the sun to see what would work and be the most cost effective. Um, so they've done everything from like, like two square miles of gravel that they put down, which just was crazy to see. and. Uh, you know, walking around on it. It was very hot, so it created this weird microclimate. Um, but that's what the city of Los Angeles, which is responsible for mitigating Owens Lake since they dried it up uh, about a century ago by diverting all its water down the, aqua the Los Angeles aqueduct. Um, so that's the method that they like the most because while it's the most expensive, it uses the least amount of water. 
Um, another thing that they use, so the most common mitigation effort they use there is called shallow flooding because believe it or not, like a, a lake wants water and that's just like what works best. So they kind of built these burned ponds. I think Manuel's gonna pull up some photos so you can see what it looks like. Um, yeah, there's the shallow flooding, yeah. So that's what the shallow flooding looks like. And it had the added benefit of, as you can see, the birds came back. The bright shrimp came back, the brine flies came back. Um, even just with a few feet of water, it was, uh, created a habitat, and they actually have a bird festival there now. But this is the method of mitigation that Los Angeles likes the least, because they would much rather be sending all that water out to their customers. Um, some other methods that they tried out there that seemed to work well is, um, so Owens Lake is about 100 square miles. That's a, a dried up lake. But um, there's kind of this briny, water at its core and it's so salty it can't evaporate and it has this crust on top. So they only really have been mitigating about half of the lake bed. Um, so they're trying to kind of recreate that brine crust in some places. And then one of the weirdest things that we saw out there was the tillage. Yeah, I can pull it up. Oh yeah, that's a good shot. So they actually borrowed this idea from like a farmer. So what they do is they, they wet the lake bed and then they just drag a plow for, across it that they specially designed for this, which seemed kind of, kind of counterintuitive to me because the, the thing that we keep hearing here at the Great Salt Lake is that we don't want to disturb the, the lake bed because then it will kick up the dust. So um, I guess if we get to about enough point where we just kind of resign ourselves to the Great Salt Lake being a dust bed, then this is another option that has worked pretty well for them. It uses a lot less water than shallow flooding. And then I, the final real mitigation effort would, would be vegetation. Certain parts of the lake are, the, the soil isn't overly salty, so they can plant native vegetation. And uh, yeah, that keeps the dust down pretty well. It takes, you know, a couple of years to establish and irrigate, and then they don't have to use any more water. And so that's effective for them. Um, do you want to show them the picture of the gravel bed? Uh, yeah. I mean, it was in Manuel's video, so you probably saw it, but it was just kind of, Weird to see. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so the state of California, which owns the lake bed, is not a fan of this um, because, it, as you can probably tell, it doesn't have a lot of aesthetic value or wildlife value. So again, like I said, California likes this best because it uses the least amount of water, but they kind of were told to stop using it so much. So yeah, and I think you asked, would these work for the Great Salt Lake? Um, I think. I think that it would, yeah, I think that what they said to us is that you kind of have to figure out what the lake wants to be in certain areas, like some certain areas, shallow flooding works better, certain areas, like I said, the vegetation will take, but it won't in other places. Um, and then gravel, like one section they dump gravel and it just immediately sunk into the lake bed, so very expensive experiment there, <laughs> so yeah. So comparison size, we said that these are comparatively smaller lakes, but what, how much smaller? So these are three mitigation efforts at Owens Lake, but what are the size differences that we're talking about and what could that mean in terms of dollars, effort, should they be replicated or efforted to be replicated here? Yeah. Yeah, so these lakes are a lot smaller than the Great Salt Lake. So like I said, Owens Lake is about 100, about 100 square miles. Um, the Great Salt Lake is about uh, 1,700 square miles at its historical average, and right now there are 800 square miles of lake bed exposed. So I guess you could do the math. With them. Like the video said, it cost the city of LA 2.5 million to mitigate. They install 4,200 miles of pipeline for this project, so you would just have to scale it up for the Great Salt Lake to be comparable. Um, and I guess you have to then start asking, like, well, where's that money going to come from? Who's going to pay for it? Because at Owens Lake, they had a big, deep-pocketed entity they could point to and say, hey, city of Los Angeles, you drain this lake, so you're responsible for cleaning up the mess. Um, here in Utah, we're kind of all responsible for the state of the Great Salt Lake, so is it going to be taxpayers that fund this? Um, are the federal, or is the federal government going to step in and offer a hand? Like, I, yeah. So... Well, and that leads us to a question about what's coming in the next couple months when our legislative session kicks off in January. What conversations are being had on Capitol Hill in Utah 
when it comes to Great Salt Lake and to implementing preventative measures or bills and kind of these mitigation, I was gonna say mitigatory, but I don't know if that's a word, some of these tools to mitigate some of these issues at the lake. What's happening from that? This is the environmentalist and the, the land use response. What's happening from a legislative response? So I would say the response from the lawmakers is not uh, this Owens Lake mitigation, it hasn't gone that far yet. Really what they're talking about right now is getting water to the lake. That is like their sole focus. And we even talked to um, some of the people doing mitigation at Owens Lake, um, like the City of Los Angeles and the Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District, which is such a mouthful, but they're kind of the regulator and make sure they're meeting the air quality standards. Uh, I asked them, like, has anyone with the state of Utah reached out to see what you're doing here? And kind of surprisingly, no. But they do come here and speak at the Great Salt Lake Issues Forum. And I know lawmakers are, attend that, so they're aware of it at least. But to answer your question, what lawmakers are mostly focused on is getting water to the lake. That is probably the cheapest solution, the easiest solution. Um, that said, it's still going to be very hard, so uh, you probably heard a lot about this $40 million trust that the legislature created last session, um, which will, part of that money will be spent on restoring habitat, but the bulk is going to go to, like, securing water leases or water rights to maybe get to the lake. Um, something that uh, just came up in the interim session discussions today is that uh, they want the water districts to actually start um, calculating how much water is actually consumed per capita, at least in the largest counties um, in the Great Salt Lake Basin. So that will be interesting, because right now what we kind of do is they'll look at how much water is diverted, like out of the river or out of the groundwater, and then divide that by the population. That's what they're doing for their, like their per capita water use. But if you think about it, like the Great Salt Lake is at the bottom of the basin, and when we use water, we don't, it doesn't just like disappear. Some of it, you know, it's flushed down the toilet or goes down the drain, and it's treated at a sewer plant, and then it ends up in the Great Salt Lake. So they want to actually figure out how much we're consuming, like how much water we're making disappear out of the basin. Um, so those are just a few examples, but uh, definitely m more talk about reforms to water law and solutions for the Great Salt Lake than I think we've ever heard from law lawmakers before. So before it completely dries up and gets to the Owens Lake level. Right. So that takes us then to Mono Lake, which did have these environmental efforts come in and, quote, save the lake as much as could be done so far. So tell us a little bit about Mono Lake. It was headed down the same path as Owens Lake, but groups came together. What did they do differently? And again, could any of these solutions work here for Great Salt Lake? Yeah, so Mono Lake, uh, kind of, you know, if we're at the fork in the road, they, they took the other direction. And uh, what they did is there was a group of students, actually, that went out and studied the Mono Lake um, and raised awareness about its its value, its environmental value, and um, all the cool things about it, like the, the brine flies and the brine shrimp and how they were struggling. Because um, for years, Los Angeles had denied that it was creating a problem there, that the, the lake's crashing had anything to do with their water consumption. So they did this big study and they, you know, what, like, kind of took LA to task, I would say, and said, how can you not be having an impact on this? And they started to build this grassroots movement that wanted to save the lake. Um, and they ended up taking the utility to court. Um, it's just this kind of, you know, scrappy group of students and environmental advocates, I guess. Um, and it was in the courts for years and years, but they kept trying various strategies, and then eventually in the 80s, they use a concept called the public trust doctrine, which basically says that while Los Angeles has a right to the water because it bought up all the water rights in Owens Valley, and that thing, well, it bought up all the land in Owens Valley, and with the land came the water rights, and that's how they were able to drain it all the way to Los Angeles. So while they had a right to that water, the lake also basically had a right to exist, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of, of that argument. However, they didn't uh, offer them any solutions as to like, okay, so how are you going to meet both of those competing interests? So it took several years with the California Water Resources Board. Um, eventually, it settled on a mandated elevation that the lake must rise to. And uh, they decided that in the 1990s. And then here, 30 years later, it still has not hit that mandated elevation. 
Um, even with LA cutting back its diversions, but at least they know where they're trying to go, right? At least they have a target, uh, they have a goal. Um, so that is also a possible path that Utah could explore for the Great Salt Lake. However, there doesn't seem to be the political will for that. Um, and I think, you know, environmental groups could sue the state maybe and try to use the public trust doctrine, but there's different politics in, in California. They have a different Supreme Court than we do. So, you know, whenever you go to court, it's always a gamble. You don't really know what's going to happen. But I think some people are getting concerned enough that the, it's an idea that at least tossing around. So, Manuel, as you've been driving the photos here, and we've been talking about both the Owens Lake and Lake Mono, as part of this collaborative project, your role was to capture visually kind of what was happening at both of these lakes and to help kind of inspire, spark, think about, have conversations around solutions. How did you try to achieve that through your visual work? And how did that pair up with all of this reporting that Leah is doing? Oh, uh, no, this, is, this works fine. It's just sort of the way we're done. Um, yeah, I think the big thing is that when, I, when we got there, uh, I've never been to Mono Lake before, and honestly, immediately, I was like, man, there, I could be here for weeks and probably not even capture like the absolute beauty that actually exists there. Um, so this was actually like weirdly easy for me to capture it visually because it was it was just so strikingly beautiful. I mean, I've never been to something like this before. Um, as you can see in the photos right here, these are uh, they're called tufas. And I've never seen anything like it before uh, until this trip. And these actually are supposed to be underwater. And so there's the whole, I mean, most of the lake, I mean, is just, these are all over the lake. And so um, uh, really, I just wanted to visually kind of capture just how beautiful they absolutely were. And it wasn't hard at all. I mean, the sunsets were amazing every night. and. Um, me and Spencer Heaps, who was the photographer with uh, Deseret News, I mean, it was easy for us to be out there until it got completely dark. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to stop shooting. To be honest, it was it was seriously amazing. Um, they draw people from all, like, all over the country. Right? Yeah, I mean, there was there was tourists from other countries that were there talking to us, asking us what we were doing, and that was uh, really cool. And I mean, that's something I've experienced at the Great Salt Lake as well. Um, but honestly, when I saw these, I mean, it was it was really easy to to kind of show their beauty really easily. I'm not going to lie. Um, but as far as the way I think it all translated, I think um, with Leah and Amy's reporting, I mean, it, it I mean, it was it was it felt natural and it felt like something that um, wasn't too difficult to pair their writing style with with what I wanted to put on there visually. And so I really, honestly, enjoy being able to um, tell the story visually, along with like Leah and Amy's writing. Um, it, it really wasn't difficult at all. So the interesting thing about this project to me is that everyone in Utah knows something about Great Salt Lake. It is our namesake feature, this lake. And so you have expertise from a wide variety of jobs, from the environment to lay people who maybe have never even visited the lake recreationally. How did you do this reporting, from a solutions perspective in particular, but also generally, to be able to make the content interesting, important, and engaging for such a wide range of knowledge? What was the approach for both of you as you did that? Sorry, this one was not a pre-approved talking point, so I'm throwing them off. Um, hmm. Well, before I answer that, I just want to say one of my favorite moments was seeing Manuel in this rickety canoe with his massive TV camera. <laughs> it's just like hoping the canoe didn't flip over, but he was a champ and it was amazing the footage she was able to get. Um, so I think the whole, like, when we pitched this idea to the collaborative, I was like, let's go to these lakes. The whole, the whole thought behind it is because we, we think that they have solutions that we can bring home. So that was kind of the focus of the, the project right away. Like at Owens Lake, it was gonna be like, okay, worst case scenario, if the Great Salt Lake turns into a dust bowl, what do they do there to, to bring it under control? 
Um, and at Mono Lake, it was like, okay, so they, Mono Lake was going down the same path, and then they took a turn, so how, how can we do that? Um, in order, but to make it engaging, I don't know, I think, I hope it was engaging for all kinds of people. Um, I think it, it was good that we were telling it across multiple mediums. I'm, I'm so glad that we had a, a very talented photographer, a very talented videographer. Um, I think uh, what instead of like writing a big long story, which some reporters like me are kind of like attracted to, like I'll just write you know this huge 20 page story about everything we saw, we decided to break it more into like bite sized stories. So like if you want to know what the public trust doctrine is, then click this story. But if you're not maybe as interested in that, you just want to like, you know, five things, five takeaways from Mono Lake to, and how it compares to the Great Salt Lake. We did a quick hit story like that. Um, we also did a story map that we experimented with, which was kind of cool with help from Salt Lake Community College. Um, so it was really interactive. So you could kind of like, I don't know, he embedded these really cool maps where you can watch a time lapse to see like how Owens Lake has like turned from the salt pan to like this weird mosaic with all these mitigation efforts along its shores. Or you can watch like Mono Lake shrinking and then rising again. Um, and then the Great Salt Lake too. There's just like all these cool interactive elements that hopefully were engaging for, for some people. Um, Do you mind if I get on your computer? Oh, no, I don't mind. If you want to. Um, it's all in that same folder. Um, you know, a big thing for, for me um, was you know, you watch a lot of news stories uh, on TV, and a lot of what you see are public officials and, you know, um, whether that's like lawmakers or police officers or UDOT, um, you know, sometimes it could get a little bit, a little bit boring. And honestly, I think the best way to make things engaging is to hear from the people who have experienced this and lived through this. And to me, while we were out there, we spoke to uh, a number of people that actually were living through all of this, um, through the dust storms, um, through the changes that have happened over the years. And honestly, that to me is like what catches people's attention, is hearing the stories and how similar uh, they are to maybe even ours over here. Um, and so I think that's probably one of the most engaging ways to get people's attention is to hear other people's stories about what they've experienced and, and what they've gone through. Um, some of them were really interesting, some of them were really kind of sad. I mean, we spoke to uh, a school teacher who told us that the dust storms got so bad that they had to like cancel recess, you know, and they couldn't stay outside and that was a real bummer for those kids and that's something that caused a lot of those kids to like move away. A lot of them had asthma too. Yeah, a lot yeah. of them had asthma, which is, I mean, that similarity has you know, been talked about here as well um, with like our air pollution and things like that. So um, I think that to me, and then obviously all these new things that everything that's happened with the collaborative has been really engaging too. I mean, I've never done a story map before and that was a new term for me. Um, and I know in the newspaper world, um, that's probably common, but for me it was totally new. Yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, I, I wanted to go to Owens Lake partly looking for solutions, but also I just, I personally was wondering like, why, why would someone stick around in a place that was known as being the worst source of human caused dust pollution in the United States? Like why would people stick around? But um, it was amazing to actually go there and see it because you realize, I mean, it was beautiful there. It was, it was gorgeous. They filmed, like, they filmed hundreds of films there just because the landscape is incredible. Um, and so for the people that stayed and stuck around, it was, it was kind of worth it to have this like beautiful mountain playground in their backyard and put up with a few dust storms a year, a few bouts of bad pollution. I'm like, that sounds kind of like home. That sounded kind of familiar, yeah. So again, as we you know, say that this, is, this project has really been all about collaboration um, and a way to pull resources, brain power, and to reach as many people as possible and to engage that interest. Um, and one really notable thing, which we talked about briefly, is the collaboration between news organizations. And on these stories, the Deseret News and the Salt Lake Tribune had bylines on the same story. This is absolutely unheard of. I don't think this has ever happened in the history of either news organization ever, period, hard stop, to have both of those names on a byline. Why does that matter to a project like this? 
Yeah, I think the reason we wanted to do that, I mean, I had first pitched this as like, I'll just go out and do all the reporting, and maybe bring Salt Lake Tribune and a photographer, but I think it was really important to the collaborative that this actually be a collaborative. And that, uh, you know, a bunch of different news agencies go, including the Tribune and the D News, which, you know, we are competitors, we've long been competitors. Um, Salt Lake is lucky to be a two newspaper town. But I think the significance is just showing the community and maybe lawmakers of this the issue is bigger than competition. It's bigger than, you know, one newsroom scooping the other, having the story that the other doesn't. Um, it's just like such an important message that we need to reach people across all platforms. And if we're being honest, like the, the Deseret News is gonna reach an audience that the Salt Lake Tribune just doesn't, and vice versa. So I think that's the way it was significant. Have you noticed any addition? I mean, you've been covering land and water use for a long time. Uh, your background is in the sort of environmental reporting. Have you noticed, well, to everyone, Heather as well, I'd like to hear from everyone, have you noticed an increase in interest from the general public as so many news organizations and partners have come together to do this work? And what, has, what changes have you noticed? What differences? Um, I could just quickly say, so one of our partners, of course, the Desert News, they had a poll um, with Hinckley Institute, and um, in this polarized uh, world we're living in, um, it's incredible that 80% of Utahns are concerned about the lake, and 73% said they want lawmakers to do something about it, and um, I think we can take credit for that in this collaborative, um, covering this, and I'm thinking of you all here, um, Maybe you don't read the Desert News or the Tribune, but maybe you saw Fox 13 or KSL or even the Standard Examiner, and that's why you're here. They're all partners, and the goal is to amplify the great work um, of this project and others so that you all around the state can be informed. Yeah, I um, started covering the Great Salt Lake's decline in starting 2014-ish. And I think for a lot of the sources and the scientists and researchers I talked to, they just kind of felt like they were screaming into the void and they felt like that way for a long time. Um, but when I talk to them now, they're sort of amazed at the engagement and the interest. Um, and even when I you know, listen to lawmakers and committee hearings and things, I mean, there are lawmakers across the state who aren't even in the Great Salt Lake Basin that are recognizing its value and its importance. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's new to me. I mean, just the fact that um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives for Utah has said that this may be the single most important issue of his political career. I think it's pretty significant um, that he's really taken this on and, and like gotten all these lawmakers on board to pass this, these big changes to our, our pretty archaic water law. So, Okay, and so one last question before we turn it over to the audience for questions. What were some of your biggest takeaways from this particular reporting trip or from the project generally, whether it's solutions, mitigation ideas, really anything? What did you leave this reporting trip from thinking, wow, that's something? Yeah, I mean, I kind of expected to go to Owens Lake and see this dead lake and feel you know, really depressed. I think a lot of us hear the story and they're like, we're just like, oh, that's so sad that that happens to that bad lake. And, um, it's actually, you know, like what, what the people there will tell you is that the lake never really died. There's always been birds going there, visiting the springs and things kind of at the lake's margins. Um, and then, you know, it bounced back with just adding some water. Like these systems, these saline lake systems are so resilient. Like the brine flies came back, the brine shrimp came back, the birds came back. So the Great Salt Lake is not beyond saving, I think is one of my big takeaways. Um, we can bring it back, we can revive it. And then even if it does go the way of Owens Lake, the dust can be mitigated. I know that's like probably the issue causing the most anxiety among the public right now is the dust. But the dust can be mitigated. We just, you know, need to figure out how we're gonna pay for it. So that was what I thought one of my big takeaways. I think one of my biggest takeaways from it was that there's not one simple solution and kind of going off what Leah said is that there is a lot of hope and you know being in um, the town of uh, what was it, Lone Pine, right? Um, Lone Pine, I mean it was still really active, there was still a lot of people in the area, um, a lot going on and I think that gives 
um, it kind of left me with some hope and not to feel like I'm an alarmist or something like that, you know, there's a lot of ways to go about this. And the big, I think the big takeaway too was, um, you know, they are very different. Um, at the same time, like, we don't necessarily have um, one entity to, to go after and um, like, this situation in California, which is LA Water and Power, um, you know, we have to get a lot of players kind of in the game, uh, whether that's like lawmakers or um, big, bigger voices in the community. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think it just left me with a lot of hope uh, that things will still end up, um, you know, positively, <laughs> hopefully in the coming years. Not, it's not the end of the world. That's all I gotta say. Heather. No, I, I guess the only takeaway is that the power of, I mean, I don't think the Tribune um, would have been able to send Leah, um, perhaps uh, for that amount of time and the amount of time that she spent writing this without the collaborative. So, um, you know, I, I think the power of collaboration is shown in this project, the project that um, Marcy put up on, on there. Um, we have another project that just came out this week about Las Vegas that we sent two reporting teams to, or, you know, a reporting team from two different three different outlets too. So um, it's exciting. Um, they are looking uh, hope, hope with teeth, right? Um, they're both hopeful after this trip. Um, so I think it speaks to the power of their work and working together. Yeah, and so it's really cool, I think, both as a media consumer, as a lifelong resident native of, of Utah and Salt Lake, uh, that it's great to see this sort of reporting happening in such a robust way. The Vegas trip is really fascinating as well. They're looking at how Las Vegas, this community in the desert, has found good solutions to managing their water, which is kind of, when you think about Vegas, it, if you don't know much about it, it seems kind of strange. Um, and so they've done this reporting trip to see what can be gleaned from that. Uh, so before we turn it over to questions, I would just like to encourage you, this is the website here, great, uh, greatsaltlakenews.org. We have a newsletter that goes out regularly that keeps you up to date on projects that are being worked on, on new stories. Stories are being published in all of these news organizations across the, uh, the valley, but you can also find all of the news by going to this website that will take you to the reporting. It's kind of a, a repository of all of it. There's social media, there's students from Salt Lake Community College involved in this work. We, um, Salt Lake Community College, with the Chronicle at the University of Utah, also took part in some collaboration to look at how both of those schools are dealing with water issues kind of inspired by the collaboration that's happening professionally. So we're seeing a lot of good things come from this and projects like our events like this, this is the second one that we've done in just over a week, you guys are such an important part of this conversation. It is not just the work being done by reporters and organizations, but you guys coming out here, engaging in the conversation, telling us what we're getting right, telling us what we should be looking at, what we could be doing better, is a crucial part of the solutions around this reporting. So, thank you all for being here. And do we have some questions? Thank you guys, first of all. <laughs> sure, if you want to scream it out, or if you want to come up and use the mic, okay. I can holler. Um, here, oh, okay. So, Okay, so I am an alarmist, and I am definitely concerned about um, the air pollution and the quality of life because of the pollution, but I also worry about the economy, and I'm curious what the eco economic situations around these other lakes look like. Like, do they have a tourism industry that's based on winter recreation activities, or and what was the impact of um, Owens Lake drying up on that local? economy, especially for the people who stayed? Um, that's a great question. So, yes, they do have winter economies. Um, uh, Owens Lake is right by Mount Whitney. It's like one of the portals, portals to get to Mount Whitney. Uh, Mono Lake is at one of the entrances to Yosemite. Um, and Mono Lake, like the Great Salt Lake, used to have all these resorts around it. Um, but then when it started shrinking, I believe they sued the utility, and the utility was just like, okay, here you go, here's money, we need the water. Um, so it did have an impact on tourism. 
Oh, it's like so, like surprisingly, like I just think because of its prox proximity to like Los Angeles and Hollywood, and like it's just it's just like stunningly beautiful there. They just like kept filming films, like they filmed Tremors there. They filmed a bunch of westerns, like John Wayne westerns. They filmed uh, like some Star Trek episodes and movies out there. So um, their economy, their tourism economy, was pretty good in Lone Pine. Um, but there's a much smaller town that's like right on the shore of the former lake, and it's called Keeler. And no matter which way the wind blew, it it blasted Keeler. And if you go to Keeler, I mean, it's like this cute little bohemian artist community, but it's also very, very low income. And you can tell it's just really, um, you know, maybe a fraction of its former self it used to be like this town that supported like a mining industry that was in the mountains nearby. Um, so yeah, there was another part to your question, I think. I kind of forgot it, so <laughs> thank you. What is this town? That's Lone Pine. Yeah, so you can see like they like preserve this cute historic western character that they have, and it's just like, it's just the charmingest little town. Like if you ever get an opportunity, like, you gotta check it out, it's so cute. And it's right, it's, it's also like right next to the Alabama Hills as well. Like literally you take like a five minute drive and you're entering the Alabama Hills, and I mean, that area is absolutely beautiful too. So I mean, you have a lot of people coming, kind of just going through the town, and I mean, I feel like it was pretty lively uh, the nights that we were there, the days that we were there. Um, people eating at all the restaurants, and yeah, it kind of felt like it was it was kind of, uh, kind of hopping over there. Yeah, I didn't realize this, but when I was booking the hotel rooms for everybody, like, it was like peak tour season, and it was really hard to find rooms, so yeah, it, it, yeah, it's got a pretty robust tourism economy. Anybody else have a question? And I noticed you mentioned the Speaker of the House is behind this issue. Brad Wilson is actually from here. This is his district. You, you may, I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, we have personal experience with Antelope Island, and in just two years, we've seen how much the Salt Lake has gone down. You're just around Antelope Island. I've noticed in some of the stories that uh, lawmakers flew over the Great Salt Lake and they were stunned at how much it had gone down. That's not stunning to people who live out here. And I, I wonder if that, how the importance lawmakers and others give to the Great Salt Lake, does that have something to do with their experience with the lake? Because of flat, I was actually surprised because I think if it, it's unfortunate because if the Great Salt Lake has been an issue for so many years, why were lawmakers so stunned? Uh, the last point is, I've seen also studies, and maybe it's the Great Salt Lake Collaborative that uh, should you know, take some credit for this, but there have been stories of the Great Salt Lake in the New York Times, in national, I think in the international press. So, long story short, I think, what, what is the impact of people having experience with the Great Salt Lake and giving importance to these issues? Thank you. Um, I, think, I think my son was oh. here, so <laughs> if you'll indulge. I've, oh, sorry. I've been wondering where the animals would go. Like the birds? Yes. Well, that's such a good question. Yeah. Did you have another part to that question you wanted to ask? I think I forgot what I was going to say. So where are the birds going to go? Um, we 12 million birds use the Great Salt Lake each year as they migrate all across the Western Hemisphere. And in the past, if one salty lake in the desert would dry up, maybe they'd go to another one. Like maybe they would have gone to Owens Lake or Mono Lake. Or, you know, when Owens Lake dried up or Mono Lake started to decline, those birds came to the Great Salt Lake. But now the birds are running out of places to go, right? Um, one of the scientists I interviewed, he compared it to if you were to get in your car and drive to Wendover and your gas tank was empty. But you know, there's a one rickety little gas station on the way, so you're gonna stop there, fill up your tank, and continue your journey. Well, say you show up there and there's this line of cars, and they're only giving away one gallon. What are you gonna do? That's kind of the, the situation the birds are facing. They're, they're kind of running out of places to go. Right, the question about um, the power of experiencing the lake, yeah. and it translates into action. 
Well, yeah, I think that's why um, the speaker got everybody into helicopters, and you know, it, it's quite stunning to see, you know, 800 miles of exposed lake bed. Like that, that sticks with you, as I'm sure you know. But you know, our lawmakers are from across the state. Some are from really rural parts of the state in southern Utah. The Great Salt Lake is not in their backyard. And you need all those lawmakers on board to pass the legislation. So uh, yes, I think just seeing how stark it is. I mean, you guys go to Antelope Island all the time. I go to Antelope Island all the time, but it never stops being like alarming, right? It never stops just like, yeah, just striking me, you know? Yeah, it makes an impression. So I think, yeah, actually seeing it probably helped move the needle. And Brad Wilson has a lot of power, so that, that doesn't hurt. Um. The other the thing that I'll add to that, the thing that I'll add to that too is that, um, you know, when with some with with the work that the collaborative is doing, it's getting more attention nationally, and I think it's hard for lawmakers to ignore that. And I go, I used to work with Ben Winslow a lot, and we were at the Capitol every single day, all day, talking to lawmakers. And his big thing that he always loved talking to them about was what's going to happen in the Salt Lake, and. I'll admit, I was even surprised too when it, it sounded like that helicopter ride was like this eye-opening thing for them. It was kind of weird because it's like you cannot notice that, uh, especially if you live in the northern part of Utah. Um, I just think getting more and more national attention, which is even what I'm seeing, is going to have to make some of those lawmakers because at the same time, like I said earlier, there's not one entity that you can kind of put this all on and you know, file a lawsuit like um, the Great Basin, um, uh, their long name, I can't remember their name. Great Basin <laughs> Unified Air Pollution Control District. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think without something like that happening, I mean, it's, it's, it makes it really hard to find, you know, um, some big solutions, um, which is what I think it's going to take. Um, and then the last thing I think I was going to say was... Nothing. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think another difference we saw with the lawmakers too is um, uh, two two legislators that got elected in recent years, Tim Hawks and Joel Ferry. So Tim Hawks, I think, works in the branch of industry as an attorney. So he's been seeing the changes happening firsthand, and Joel Ferry works on the Bear River, right next to the Great Salt Lake. So I think they saw the changes that were happening, so they kind of like also whipped up some support in the background for some of this legislation. Um, because, you know, it was only a few years ago that lawmakers, like, approved this massive landfill right on Promontory Point, just, you know, a few yards away from the water. Um, because they said, and they said, and I quote, that is the most ideal spot for a landfill, like, out there by that lake, you know. Like, that's, that's how people were viewing the lake not that long ago, so. Well, and I, I just wanted to underscore the national attention that you brought up with the New York Times article. The work that the collab, the work, the collaborative had our, our, our collaborative had already started its work when that happened. And I will say it was a little frustrating initially when this collaborative has been doing all this work and suddenly even local media who are part of this collaborative are retweeting and sharing the work of the New York Times. But then we all, like, at least I took a deep breath and was like, this is good. This sort of national attention is good for the work that this collaborative is doing. John Oliver did a segment on water as well, and like, the Grace Salt Lake was mentioned. And anytime John Oliver does something on last week, tonight with John Oliver, it goes bonkers, crazy, cuckoo, like, he changes the world with, like, one word. So all of this is good. The national attention that it's getting is good for us, and it is good for the work that these reporters and this team is doing, I think you know, more the merrier, come to the party on reporting about issues at, at Great Salt Lake. Um, I think that that's time, but we will stick around, especially, and people don't have questions for me, I'm sure, but these folks will be around if you have questions. Um, we also have some stickers and some pamphlets, but I encourage you to please keep with us. Thank you so much for being here. Share what you learned with folks. Follow us on social, hit the website, sign up for the newsletter, and keep the conversation going. Um, that's the most important thing, and especially, what is your name, sir? Young man in the middle? Yeah, what's your name? How old are you? Eight. You're eight, so are you in third grade? Yeah. Next year, you get to learn all about the state of Utah in school, and that means you'll probably do a lot with Great Salt Lake and what you're learning. 
You, my friend, these questions that you have are some of the most important questions to be asking. So go and talk to your friends at school and let them know what you're learning and let them know if you care. What's your question? Cool. So what was in your project about Antelope Island? Um, where would the animals go? Like the buffalo and the birds? Cool. Great. And did you share that with your friends and your classmates? Yeah. Good. See, that's exactly what you should be doing. And honestly, that question of where will the animals go, every single one of us should be asking that question because we can apply a different knowledge to that based on our own backgrounds. And this young man, this third grader here, can help all of us learn a little bit through this reporting. So that's my optimistic ending to this, this hard story. Thank you so much for joining us, and hope you have a good night. Wait, there was a question online. Oh, there's a question online. Sorry, <laughs> online folks, thank you for joining us. What is the question Let's from online? See. Um, oh, they had to leave. Let's see. Um, an article stated that if agriculture were to save 20% of the 63% total of the state's water that it uses, it would increase the amount of water going into the Great Salt Lake by 14.8%. How many feet of depth would that translate to and what's being done to achieve that? Ooh, yeah. I can't even repeat that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how many feet that would increase it by. Um, some statistics I could rattle off is that uh, the lake would be 11 feet higher if not for human diversions. Uh, I think, let's see, um, uh, okay, uh, also the Great Salt Lake means about 2 million acre feet flowing to it each year to be sustainable, to reach a sustainable elevation. Um, last year they had a deficit of about 250,000 acres each. Okay, wow. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question, so it's just on the record. Uh, article stated that if ag were to save 20% of the 63% total of the state's water that it uses, it would increase the amount of water going into Great Salt Lake to 14.8%. How many feet of depth would that translate to and what's being done to achieve that? Okay, so I, I don't know how many feet that it would raise, but I'm sure I can ask somebody to find out and do a follow-up story. Um, as far as what is being done to achieve that, um, something that state lawmakers and policymakers are really liking to tout is all the money they're funneling into agricultural um, irrigation optimization. So millions and millions of dollars, a lot of it from the pandemic aid is going toward that. Um, whether that's going to work remains to be seen because the farmers will have to install these optimized irrigation systems and then we'll have to see if they're using the water they're saving to grow other crops or like more cuttings of crops or if they're actually letting the water stay in the system. So I don't know that we'll know if that's working for a few years. So I know that's not a great answer to your question, but I did my best. <laughs> I already gave my ending spiel, so thank you everybody <laughs> for being here. Have a great night.